presentation is called, What's All the Buzz About Play? And many of you may be familiar with the fact that Harvard University now has an Institute for Happiness and Health. Stanford University features several programs in its curriculum on happiness. The June version, uh, edition of John Hopkins Magazine this year was all about fun. People are starting to catch on. You might be out of a job soon, Jen. <laughs> but there's a lot of buzz around play these days. We're going to ask you all to play with a metaphor today. We're going to be talking a lot about bees. What do bees have to do with fun? Well, think about it. What do bees do all day long? They connect, collect pollen. They seek out beauty. They are looking for flowers and collecting pollen. Then they bring it back to the hive. And perhaps each table here can think of your group being some 10 as a hive. Okay? They bring it back to the hive. And in that hive, the bees create collectively honey. Honey, this beautiful sweet nectar. And guess what? Every one of you has a honey stick to remember this. That honey nurtures the hive. It nurtures the young. It is the food of their efforts of going out and collecting beauty. It's a way to be in this world. It's a way to be playful. So we're going to think about fun in the context of bees today. I hope no one's allergic to bees here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We're going to try and change your framework of thinking about them just a little bit. We are hardwired for play. Play is an instinct located at the amygdala, the base of our brains, the most primitive portion of our brain along with all of our other instincts for survival. The instinct to reproduce, the instinct to feed ourselves, the instincts to defend ourselves, the instincts to shelter and stay warm. Play is right there, which must indicate that it is essential for some reason. But how many of you all play every day? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, I see one hand back there. Yay! There's another. Good. I knew a couple of you did. So, but play is an essential part of our well-being. Why is it instinctual? This thing is not going to cooperate. We have a button for that. Whoops, we missed a slide too. Hold on. Check this out. Play is observed in everything from electrons to elephants. Electrons, yeah, believe it or not. We don't know that electrons play. However, quantum physicists have observed the behavior of electrons. And they describe it as random, haphazard, purposeless, bouncy. What does that sound like? Play. Maybe that's where it all begins. But we've also observed it in things as large as elephants. Perhaps play is our source of joyful connection with things greater than ourselves. I want to show you this great little video. I have shared with the groups this morning that I am a lover of YouTube animal videos. I have kind of a collection of animals doing fun things. Here's an example. Let's see if I can cue it up to play here. There it is. Check out this guy. He has a fire hydrant hose. <laughs> Has anyone played with a ribbon like that before? Have you seen your children play with ribbons? 
Look at him go. And of course, someone else comes along, wants to join in the fun. That's one of the beautiful things about play. We want to share it. Yeah, that's a sweet thing. Here's another example. Have any of you seen this story on YouTube, Google? A photographer went to Alaska one November. And November is the season where the ice surfaces haven't really frozen solid yet. And it's a really difficult time of year for polar bears to feed. But he didn't go up to shoot pictures of polar bears. He went up to shoot a picture of huskies, sled dogs. And he and the musher, the sled, sled dog team's owner, were in a warm-up hut having a cup of coffee and looked out the window. All the huskies were chained up outdoors, each one chained to each other. And 100 yards in the distance was a polar bear approaching. You can imagine the dread, the trepidation, the depth of fear that both the musher and the photographer experienced when they saw this polar bear approaching. And the polar bear was in a predatory posture, head down, low, crouched, had an easy meal with a team of huskies chained up. And polar bears are fast. There was not enough time for the sled dog uh, musher to go out and bring them all in. But something fascinating happened. Now remember, I talked about play being instinctual, located in the amygdala, the most primitive form of the brain, along with the other survival instincts. The huskies didn't respond in fear. The lead dog got into a play posture. Do I have any yogis here? Any people practice yoga? Downward facing dog. Have you all seen downward facing dog, the asana? Tail in the air, butt wagging, ears perked up. The huskies invited the polar bear to play. That polar bear went from a predatory posture to a play posture in just a nick of time. The sled dogs and the polar bear played together for 15 minutes that day before the polar bear went off. And that polar bear came back over the course of that week every day to play with the huskies. We see in this polar bear him lying with his belly exposed. That is the most vulnerable posture for any mammal. Notice mine is not exposed. <laughs> But he, the polar bear is inviting the husky to play. And if you go online and Google this, you'll see pictures of the polar bear holding the husky's head in its mouth. That's how trusting of a relationship the bear and the huskies developed over the course of play. Any wonder why that's a survival instinct? Something to think about. Anyway, I think it's a beautiful story showing how instinct of play was used to divert the energy of the predator, and also how important it was to the predator who needed to eat. It was a hard time of the year for that polar bear to eat. But his desire to play, that instinct to play, superseded his need to eat at that time. Pretty darn important. Earlier today, we've talked about the qualities of play in some of the workshops, and we've touched on a couple things. So I know some of you have heard us say that play is purposeless. We do it because it feels good. It is voluntary. It is pleasurable. Opposite of voluntary, obligatory. If you have to do it, chances are it's not fun and it's not play. Okay? Pleasurable, that's a no-brainer. It's easy. Freedom from time. We feel good. We aren't thinking about where we are or what obligations we have. Diminished self-awareness. We're not feeling self-conscious or awkward. We're 
kind of just in the game. Spontaneous and improvisational. We adapt. We want to see the game keep going. And we'll do what it takes to make that happen. So I want to take a detour with a little game first before we move any further. Everyone have a paper plate? You'll need a paper plate and you'll need a pen. Let somebody know if, in a blue shirt if you need a paper plate. All right, the next piece. Yeah, feel free to use the magic markers if you don't have a pen. That's absolutely what they're there for. Among other things that we're going to do that are playful today. The next thing I want you to do is just give yourself a little check-in. We've done this in the other workshops today. Let's see where you are energetically. It's been a long day. You've been inside. Maybe you haven't had a lot of movement. So rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 being you're ready to crawl under a rock and hibernate. 10, you're euphoric. You feel like you can fly and everything is wonderful and right with the world. Just rate yourself. Lodge it up in your memory. Write it down. Okay. You don't have to write it on the paper plate, but you can if you want to. If it helps you remember to write it down. Okay. Now, the paper plate. Playing with metaphors again. How many of you have full plates? Not the paper plate, but your lives? Yeah? yeah. Before we continue, I want you to empty your brain of what's on your plate in your life and write it down on the paper plate in front of you. Just brainstorm all those things that you wish you did not have to deal with. Things that you are ready to get rid of whether it's realistic or not. You can live in the realm of fantasy and be playful for a while if you like. Anything troublesome, anything burdensome. And again, you're allowed to live in the realm of fantasy and write down anything. No filters. Two days ago, I might have put my son's name on that plate. <laughs> He's 17. Not today, though. All right. Everybody finished? Okay. Does anyone remember that little ritual after high school or college graduation where you throw the mortar board in the air? Kind of the symbol of, I am done, this is over, no more exams, no more tests. You all remember that? Okay. I want you to wave your paper plates and toss them in the air. Get rid of them. Woo! Freedom! <laughs> so for the rest of the hour, your problems are gone. Okay? Woo! It really All is. All right. How's it feel? Yeah? Does it feel good? Okay. Good deal. That's a really useful tool. When you're feeling like your plate is too heavy, toss it. All right. Sir David Hawkins is a physicist, I mean, excuse me, a psychiatrist and a physician and has done a lot of wor uh, work that um, is drawn upon by the healing touch community. And he po postulated that we are evolving towards joy. He believed that one of the most evolved states of being in human consciousness is joy, even above love. Why above love? Well, I think for love connotes, love connotes many different things for us but it often has attachment. Joy tends to transcend that. 
And Jen and I think that perhaps our drive to play may be related to our evolution towards joy because play leaves us with that feeling. And it's a feeling that invites warmth and community and connection and allows us to transcend our problems. So, we've got another game for you. This is called Hive Humming. Okay? Hive Humming. We're talking about raising our vibration. Well, when you hear a buzz, doesn't that kind of sound like a vibration to you? Can we hear a buzz from everyone? Okay, that's not the activity. <laughs> the next one might involve a little bit of musical chairs because you all are all spread out. We don't have cooties, but looks like we do. <laughs> the empty seats. What we'd like you to do is to group up into approximate groups of 10, okay? But before you start moving, we were kind of thinking everyone in a row would work, but that may not work, so 10 will do it. If it's not quite 10, that's fine too. The next thing, after you've found a group, I want each group to come up with a signature sound. That sound can be a clap, it can be an animal noise, it can be a note, did that scare y'all? <laughs> uh, it can be any sound you want it to be, it can be a rhythm, you name it. But you have to be able to sustain that sound for five seconds, okay? So each group, then I'm going to come around and ask each group to share its sound with the whole group. And then we're going to have a cacophony symphony. Okay, are you ready? All right, find a group and make a sound. You've got about 30 seconds to come up with a sound. Don't think too hard. guys about ready. All right, I'm going to point to the different groups and you guys will share your sound. So each of you, each group does it for five seconds. I'll hold my hand up. When I put my hand down, that's your turn to be quiet and let the next group go. Does everybody have a sound? Does everybody have a sound? All right. Ready? Go for it. Excellent. Next group. Excellent. Fantastic. This group in front of me. Bravo. Standing. <laughs> One more time. Excellent. Fantastic. Ready? Okay, great. Excellent. Right behind them. 
subtle, okay. And back in this corner. Oh. <laughs> we had two groups. We'll do the one closest to me first. Okay, ready? Go ahead. Excellent. All right, folks in the back there. Super. And you have color waving with it, too. Total kinesthetic package. Way in the back. Excellent. This table, the long table, do you have a group together with the sound? Excellent. All right. You guys, standing up there. Super. All right. A, a groups I haven't done yet called. Can you stand up so I can see you? All right. You ready? Make, make a noise. Make a joyful noise. Beautiful. Any, is that everybody? Oh, okay. Let's get the group closest to me first. Oh. Well, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. There are the quiet ones back there. All right, and last but not least. Oh, we've got two more. I'm sorry. How did I miss that? Okay, let's get you guys first. Ready? <laughs> Fantastic. And um, last but not least, ready? <laughs> All right, big hand for everybody. Now let's play with this a little more. Don't give up yet. Let's have everybody on this side of the room make your noise. side of the room. Excellent. Do you think we can do a noise wave from the beginning to the back of the room? Let's see. You ready? Go start in the front and move your way back. Ready, set, go. Excellent. All right, last thing is the symphony. Now, this is really hard with a big room. We're going to, are you up for an experiment? Yeah. yeah? All right, kind of, sort of, some of you? Roll with it. I'm going to point to different groups, okay? And you are going to sustain your group's noise until I tell you to stop. So we might have three or four different groups going on at a time. I'm the conductor. Okay? Ready for the experiment? Okay.
Everybody get a laugh. <laughs> Funny little thing about laughter we've shared a couple times. On average, kindergartners laugh 300 times a day. Adults, on average, laugh 15 times a day. So, hope you enjoyed that. Raised your energy levels a little bit, raised your vibration, made you laugh. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jen. Thank you. So, where's your number now? You don't have to share it, but just keep it in mind. Where's that number, your energy level? So as Jenny shared, we're hardwired for play. From polar bears to elephants to possibly electrons. If it feels good and it's good for us, why don't we play more? Let me ask again, how many people take time to play every day? And hold your hand up really high this time, every day. Take a look around the room. This is an instinct. Now, I'm actually even going to put my hand halfway down. I'm a fun coach. I don't even remember to play every day. So that says something. Well, why is that? Some would argue that we live in a culture that's become afraid to play. And if you look at the 24-hour news cycle, well, it's no wonder. The world's a pretty scary place, isn't it? Especially recently. What's interesting, though, is that if you look at the uniform crime reporting statistics that the FBI compiles from all the federal agencies around our country, the level of crime right now is actually about the same as it was, level of violent crime, 40 years ago. Is that surprising to anyone? The world isn't necessarily a more dangerous place, at least not on a daily basis. So that's not a great excuse. And in fact, um, just an interesting statistic with children, approximately 90% of their free time is spent at home, indoors, plugged into technology. Kids last, used to be the, the last frontier for holding down play. And they're not even playing very much anymore. So what excuses do we use as adults? Do any of these look familiar? Play is a waste of time, it's a reward, it's just for kids, it's expensive. We need the right equipment, right? Or we need to save up for that really awesome beach vacation. What about the to-do list? How many of us ever finish our to-do list? I'm not going to wait around for a show of hands on that one. Yeah, none of us do. And what happens if we don't even put play on the list? That helps explain why so few of us raise our hand about the everyday playing. Now, for adults, we have another set of things that are kind of working against us, things that inhibit our natural instinct for play. Sense of obligation, that belief that we need to work ourselves literally to death to provide for our families, and in some cases, that's exactly what we're doing. Fear of judgment. And that one leads to the last one there, reliance on social lubricants, a drink, you know, to give us an excuse to be silly. I was so encouraged to see some concurrent sessions devoted to the topic of substance abuse and elders. It's not even just a problem with elders. There are 22 million of us right now in this country struggling with active addiction, 23 million in recovery. How many of us know someone who's either struggling has a challenge with substances or know someone in recovery, look around the room this time. Yeah, it touches, it touches one in three families. And here's the irony. Play elevates our mood. And we certainly didn't need it as kids. We knew how to play without substances. And substances, particularly alcohol, are depressants. So when we use that excuse to help be a little more silly, we're actually limiting the benefits we can get from play. So our goal is to help make it more accessible. And we're going to scare the pants off you to do it. So what happens when we don't play enough? Thank you, Jenny. If you do, that would be great. Well, I hate to be Debbie Downer, but as you might imagine, I'm going to tell you the news is not so good. So Stuart Brown is the world's leading play researcher. He's actually an American psychiatrist. 
He's been studying play and its impact on humans for more than 40 years. But he did not start out studying play. That wasn't his intended profession. As a newly minted psychiatrist, he was actually in Texas at the time our country did have its first mass shooting, when it wasn't so safe, at the University of Texas at Austin, the Texas Tower Massacre. And this was back in 1966. I don't know if anyone remembers that. But Charles Whitman took his own life and 17 other individuals and wounded 40 others. And it was a horrible tragedy. And the state of Texas was in shock. So the governor asked Stuart Brown and a team of researchers to try and figure out what could have led Charles Whitman to commit this crime. Stuart Brown went into the federal prison system and interviewed thousands of convicted murderers. And he dug into the life history of Charles Whitman. And he found this startling statistic. 90% of convicted murderers lacked opportunities to play in childhood. What's more, this one variable, play deprivation, was as predictive of violence as any other risk factor, including violence in the home. Now, hopefully no one here um, can relate to that. But Stuart Brown's been studying play for an awful long time, not just convicted felons. In fact, he's studied people from all walks of life, people just like you and I, all the way up to Nobel laureates, just like you and I. And here's what he's found, that when we don't play enough, we're all vulnerable. We're all likely to experience fixed and rigid thinking when we're not playing enough. We can become depressed. We become less resilient physically, socially, emotionally, mentally. We can become burned out easily and less able to thrive and survive. That's a pretty bold claim. Well, I've got evidence, so I'm going to share some with you. This is our friend, the lab rat, who does not appear to be thriving or surviving. He's not. He was part of an experiment in which two groups of juvenile lab rats were introduced to the scent of a cat collar, or a scented cat collar. One group had been allowed to engage in normal play behavior, but the other group had been play deprived, like Stuart Brown had found in this population of convicted felons. Now, when that threat was introduced to their environment, both groups of rats ran and hid following that survival instinct. But when the threat was removed, something curious happened. The group that had been allowed to play, they came back after a short period of time, tested the surroundings, saw the coast was clear, and they resumed normal activity. The play-deprived group never came back, not a single rat. They starved to death. Why is that? Well, they hadn't been able to test boundaries. They didn't know what was safe and what wasn't. They hadn't been able to take healthy risks. And why should we care about the fate of the lab rat? For those of you um, who are interested in studying scientific research, you may know that we study rats in addition to being ubiquitous because we share a similar neurochemistry. And so the fate of the lab rat really does have something to say. There are implications for our ability to thrive and survive when we don't play enough. So, I'm hopeful, we can advance that after presenting some of this research, that you're at least willing to entertain um, what Brian Sutton Smith, a Fulbright scholar, has said, is that the opposite of work, is not, or opposite of play is not work, it's depression. And if you're not willing to believe that, let's do a little, another little game and see if we can give you a little additional motivation. So how many of you know the game Whack-A-Mole? Yes, I'm hearing some giggles. Awesome. So a very popular toddler game, which involves little moles popping up randomly and annoyingly, and then you try and <laughs> make them pop back down. So Jenny clearly has volunteered to be our mole. I'm not going to come around whacking you guys, I promise. I play enough, so that's not a risk factor for me. So, 
what I am going to do is ask you to pop up or wave your hands in the air when you hear a way that you'd like to play in the past and maybe a way that you like to play now. So, for instance, I love to climb trees. Oh, if you'd like to climb trees, wave your hands. Okay? And back down. How about building blanket forts? Stand up or wave your hands. Awesome. And, okay, I'll offer one more, and then I'd love to get just a couple of suggestions from people in the audience, maybe our daily dosers. So how about Red Rover, Red Rover, then Jenny right over. Awesome. And take, take a look around and notice who likes to play like you like to play. Who else would like to offer a way to play? You can just pop up like a mole. I, I promise I won't do any more whacking of the mole. Annie, Annie? That's awesome. Over the roof. Annie, Annie, over. How many played Annie, Annie, over or tossed the ball over a rooftop? Awesome. Monkey in the middle. Monkey in the middle. I'm up. Yeah? Hopscotch. I heard hopscotch. Hide and seek. Awesome. Jacks. Beautiful. Oh, that's an awesome one. That's air guitar. Sorry. Awesome. Awesome. So... These are universal ways, some of them, universal ways to play. And actually, on the Maya Conference website, we have a handout with just a ton. I think it's more than 100 ways that are very common. And that is a great way to connect with those you love, those you may be serving, um, clients. It's a great way to connect with each other. Because we share that in common, many of these playful ways. So now I'm going to invite Jenny, who's already here at Share with us what's happening as we play and remember playing. Okay, and something to keep in mind, as you go home today, you may want to interact with your families and share different ways that you play. Because just reflecting on those memories is going to do some of the same things that play does that are wonderful therapeutic consequences. So let's go there now. What happens in our body and brains when we play? Well, this is fascinating. Each of you is a pharmacist. Did you know that? Between your ears, you have your own personal pharmaceutical company. You are manufacturing all kinds of neurotransmitters and hormones that affect your ability to emotionally and physically navigate this world. Dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, oxytocin, uh, I'm trying to think of some others now, even testosterone and estrogen balance out in factoring into our mood. All of those things exist in your brain and your activities and your choices about what you do with your body and what you put into it can influence it in wonderful ways especially with play. So, one thing we know about play, absolutely, is that it assists us in growing bigger, smarter brains. It's why it's critical for children. It's how we explore our world. It's how we experiment. And it's how we make connections. Play stimulates nerve growth. It stimulates the ability to link one neuron to another. The more you play, the more connections you make. It's the primary way that we learn. And what is really tragic right now in our education system is that we are depriving children of the way that they learn the best, which is through play, through experimentation. Experiential learning has been proven to etch the information into our brains because we come about that information from multiple avenues when we play. 
play also activates genes that stimulate activity that supports focus and learning. Now, genetic theory has grown exponentially. We used to believe that if we had a gene for one con condition or another, it was predetermined that we would manifest that condition in our lives. We have learned that that's not true. Genes can be turned on and turned off, just like light switches can. And we have also learned that play activates genes that support learning and memory. Real important. Um, my genes didn't get activated until several years ago, apparently. <laughs> that may be true for some of us as well. Another wonderful thing about play, when we play, every lobe of the brain lights up. The urge to play begins in the amygdala. But when we are engaged in play, and I do want to take you back to the definition of play, that idea of, you know, voluntary purposelessness, timelessness. You know, we think about flow from Mihai to Xen Mihai, researcher. Have you all, are you familiar with the concept of flow? Just being in the zone, that's all you're thinking about. You're enjoying it. Also, deep play. That's the kind of play we're talking about that lights up the brain. So every lobe, both hemispheres are communicating with each other and creating new neural nets that enhance our flexibility, our ability, um, the ways that we can think innovatively and creatively. There's only one other activity that lights up the brain like this. Anyone know what it is? Want to wager a guess? <laughs> meditation. Meditation. Granted, there are multiple types of meditation, but meditation in general is capable of lighting up the brain. And it's, many of you don't need to be sold on the idea of meditation. But it brings me to the idea that maybe play is a form of meditation. Oops, did I miss? Yep. I'm sorry. You're good. The ruts. How many of you all drive home the same way every day from work? Okay. Consider the possibility of going home a different way. Our brains do like to do the same things over and over because I think most people like to exert the least amount of effort. But in doing that, we get stuck in ruts, and it can be real difficult to get out of them. The more you do something the same way, the more muscle memory, the more brain memory that you have in doing it the same way. But it does not create flexibility in thinking. Earlier today, we were talking about writing with our left hands instead of our right hands to integrate both hemispheres of our brain. It also helps build new neural nets. Playing will do that because playing, by its nature, is adaptive. Okay? We improvise. We are trying to change the rules to make it continue. That gets us out of ruts. So think of all the things you might be able to do differently. Brushing your teeth. And if you're left hand, if you're right handed, changing which foot you step forward with when you begin walking. It may be opening the doorknob with a different hand. It may be walking to the next office with a zigzag route. All of those things help keep us flexible thinkers and playful. And then awe and wonder. That's another thing. Awe, the emotional state of awe, the emotional state of wonder helps us to reduce the pro-inflammatory cytokines that cause us to ache and have a lot of pain. Awe and wonder is a natural drug. And it's not hard to find it. If you've got a computer and it's a rainy day, go look at the best pictures of the year on a National Geographic site. That's an easy one. 
Watch children play. Look out the window, but find something that makes you go, wow. Listen to wonderful music. Immerse yourself in it because you are bathing yourself in hormones that help reduce inflammation and prevent cytokines from accumulating. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Play also helps to regulate cortisol. We all know that cortisol is a stress hormone. It is secreted when our adrenals are engaged. Play helps reduce that. Lower stress, lower hypertension, less heart disease, fewer circulatory issues. Cortisol does a lot of damage to our bodies. Now granted, we're supposed to be able to engage those adrenals and react and have cortisol when we are stressed, but stress is not supposed to be a chronic condition in our lives. And we've got that biological instinct called play that's supposed to counter, counteract the effects of stress and cortisol. I wanted to say one more thing about cortisol, I just remembered. Amy Cuddy is a sociologist at Harvard. Have any of you seen her YouTube on power poses? Oh boy, you've got some fun ahead of you. I'm going to give you the quick version of it. I'm going to do my Wonder Woman pose. Y'all ready? All right, let's see yours. <laughs> there you go. Two minutes of striking a powerful pose increases testosterone levels. Yes, women, we have it too, but not to uh, abnormal levels. But testosterone is that hormone that contributes to our sense of confidence and security. Power posing also increases our oxytocin levels. Oxytocin helps us to feel connected. I'm lousy at telling jokes, but most um, public speakers will start with a joke because if they laugh with their audience, they feel more connected to their audience. I just do silly things to make you laugh. <laughs> so, I won't bear my belly, though. <laughs> but again, the testosterone and oxytocin also engage in that cortisol cycle and lower it. If you have a public speaking engagement, you may find yourself in a bathroom stall like Jen and I do frequently in our power poses. <laughs> Door closed. <laughs> Play does help us in our relationships with others in big ways other than just regulating hormones. It helps us to establish trust. When we play, we're testing boundaries. We're pushing, getting a little pushback. In that process, we learn how we feel when we're pushed, and we learn how to anticipate how other people will feel, too. That's important in building community. We develop empathy in the process, too. Wow, that hurt me. That might hurt that guy. Ooh, that felt good. Oh, that was effective. We learn how to feel what other people are experiencing. We also learn about healthy boundaries. And these are also reasons why it's so critical for our children to be engaged in play in schools. Because learning healthy boundaries helps us grow as adults. It helps us be mature and respectful and engage in community activities where we are feeling safe enough to be creative and collaborate and to express ourselves honestly and openly without feeling vulnerable to pain. So it allows us to take appropriate risks. All this collaboratively and creatively. We go back to that metaphor about the bees, because they're all collaborating, seeking out beauty, and making honey. So, we're going to have another game, okay? We need everybody on this side of the room to hold hands with one other, hold hands, 
make a big snake. Everyone should be connected. And this side of the room, same thing. One big long snake. Musical chairs again. We're at it again. Are we connected? Yeah, we need to be connected all the way from the very beginning to the very end. This side of the room, do you think you're all connected? Yep. Still working on it over here? Got it? The whole side, one big long snake. Okay. All right, last request. Gina's the last person on the end. You want to be able to access this. And you are the last person on this, so you want to be able to access this easily, too. So, yeah, you're going to have to move. Sorry about that, folks. All right. This is called the electric handshake. And we are boosting our oxytocin levels just by holding hands with each other. Unfortunately, the people on the ends aren't getting twice as much. But <laughs> we are going to have a little race between these two sides of the room. Jen, I need a hand. We need Who's the first person in the back on each team? It is your job, when I say go, to squeeze the hand. And then that person is going to squeeze the Pass next person. And we are going to send good vibes through the whole room, one person at a time. Do you understand? No cheating. They're starting in the back. And, and when it gets to you, or it gets to you, you run and... Okay? That way we'll know who won. You ready to send some good vibes? Question. We have a question. I think. Are you guys all ready? Okay. Team left. Ready? ready. Team right. Ready? ready? On your mark. Get set. Go. So this quote really sums it up, I think. 
We don't stop playing because we grow old. Am I doing that right? Got it. Yeah? We grow old because we stop playing. So do you think that's true? It is. The research would say it is. So let's take a look at that. If you were here last year, you were treated to exploring this research with Van Butner, the Blue Zones research. How many of y'all are familiar with the Blue Zones? Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo! Yeah. So um, Dan Butner, for those of you who aren't, he's a National Geographic Society fellow, and he and a team of researchers have traveled around the world for more than a decade studying the places where people live the longest, healthiest, and happiest lives. And so of all the zones, The bluest is probably Okinawa, Japan. People in Okinawa regularly live into their 90s. It's not uncommon for them to live to 100 and beyond and to do so with health and vigor. So what's their secret? Well, we hope that you you will remember that. Yeah, diet and exercise is what comes to mind first and foremost for many people who've seen the research. But... Dr. Brown also went through this research and discovered that play, social interaction, is as important as diet and exercise for explaining this amazing longevity. Okinawans are extremely social. They often have the same friends for life. They travel, I think it's called a moai, four or five friends that are there that they share their successes and um, struggles with throughout their life. And they also have a lot of intergenerational play. And so it's not uncommon for a great great-great-grandmother to still be participating in the care and the play with the newest members of the community, newborn infants. Let's take a look a little closer to home. The Einstein Aging Study. This is another National Institution on Aging study. It's ongoing. They've been conducting it for more than 40 years now. And they found something really, I think, quite stunning. Some of the best excuses for play. Individuals who engage in cognitive forms of play, and this is a study 70 years and older, more than 2,000 seniors have been researched at this point, that cognitive games like reading, playing board games, playing a musical instrument, dancing, I didn't think that was cognitive, but it seems to confer the same benefit, up to a 63% reduced risk for dementia. That is far better than Naminda last time I checked. It's really an impressive statistic. Now, other studies have borne this out as well. This one's a little more recent. It's been reported in the Journals of Gerontology. And this study was conducted over 1,500 individuals ages 65 and over. They looked again at cognitive leisure activities, but they also looked at physical play, like gardening, walking, group exercises, dancing again and also social play, that socializing that was so important in Okinawan culture. And they found that engaging in any one of these types of activities regularly, so that's several times a week, participants over the course of several years in the study maintain their cognitive abilities. What was even more stunning is that individuals who engaged in two or more types of these activities, so maybe gardening regularly several times a week and getting together with friends, actually all three. Those individuals actually improved their cognitive abilities over the course of the study. They continued to age, but they got sharper. That's really exciting. Now, what if we are already experiencing some memory challenges? I know that actually started for me when I had my first child. So (laughs) it comes to us all at different times. Um, and it may be something that someone that we are, that we love or that we're caring for as a professional um, is already experiencing signs of dementia or memory, cognitive decline. Is it too late? Not at all. Play is designed to support us throughout our life cycle. And particularly important when we're experiencing challenges, it can be a great relief and a great healing force when we're struggling. Stuart Brown has found that introducing preferred play activities into dementia care settings actually boosts mood. Remember, Jenny said it's pleasurable. That's one of the qualities of play that's built right in. So we feel better when we play in ways that we like to play. And we also build that trust and a sense of safety 
We feel the empathy of others. And so our levels of anxiety and agitation naturally decline. And what that can translate to is a reduced need for medication. And for those working with individuals in long-term care settings, you know that over-medication of residents is a real concern. Play doesn't have the side effects that some of these powerful psychoactive medications do. So anything that can help reduce the dosage or the need for these, that can help us feel better, is to really be explored and celebrated. So let's look at, if you'll go back one, Jenny, let's look at some of the specific types of the preferred play activities, how they can help. So creative play has had numerous studies showing the benefits of that. I was really excited that Karine was here and um, we had three different concurrent sessions on the importance of creative engagement. So again, that not only makes us feel good, whether we like to paint, draw, color, doodle, sew, all of those dramatic arts, all of those ways of expressing ourselves help boost our mood. But they also sharpen our focus, our memory, our concentration. They help us communicate with each other. They help us connect, particularly if we're engaging creatively in a group setting. It also naturally reduces anxiety, isolation, depression. What y'all may not know, and this was something they discovered in the Creative Aging Study, that it can reduce, regular creative expression can reduce the number of falls we experience. Falls? That doesn't make a lot of sense. It can reduce the number of illnesses we have each year, reduce the number of doctor's visits. So there's a lot going on when we give ourselves the opportunity to play creatively. So that's one, one way to keep in mind that's a really powerful way to successfully support our aging process. Another one, one of my favorites, is music. So you remember that playing a musical instrument was one of the things in the Einstein Aging Study that contributed to that radical reduction in dementia risk. And part of the reasoning behind that is believed that cognitively challenging activities help us build cognitive reserve. We're using more of our brain. We can suffer an injury to any one part of it, and there's more for us to draw on. So that's one way that playing an instrument is really beneficial, that we don't necessarily lose function even if we start to notice some decline in some areas. But listening to music and singing are also really powerful, and we don't often recognize that. How many of you have seen um, Alive Inside? The documentary, uh, just, just one. I highly recommend, this movie is shocking. It's really dramatic, what it shows, the ability of bringing preferred music, the music that reminds us of our ageless spirits into long-term care settings, residents who are uncommunicative, literally coming alive before your eyes when they got back their music in just moments. It's really um, fascinating. And I saw that in my own life. My grandmother suffered a stroke a few years ago, and she um, had expressive aphasia. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but the inability to communicate. And so when we would sing songs together, she could find her words. In fact, she remembered the lyrics better than we did. And so in that way, we were able to give my grandmother her voice back and give her joy back. And it was, I will forever be grateful for that way of playing, and I highly recommend it for all of us. Um, another great way to play if you like that. Great laughter. Jenny's already alluded to this. This is one of our favorites. It really is the best medicine. This is a laundry list of benefits, and they're not all of them. There is almost nothing that laughter doesn't do. It improves our cardiovascular health. It boosts our immunity. It is a pain reliever. They found that individuals in hospital settings who laugh more require fewer painkillers. It connects us with others. Oxytocin is one of the factors behind it, but it's also a way of showing empathy. And in fact, we often laugh, not because something is very funny, but to show that we understand another person's situation. So it's a very healing influence. It lowers our blood pressure, and of course it boosts our mood. And I don't know, some of you have already heard the statistics, but it's great exercise too. So 100 belly laughs 
are equivalent to 15 minutes on an exercise bike. Now, we're not laughing enough, because Jenny already shared that statistic. As adults, 15 versus 300, we got a lot of room for improvement there. And one of the things that's wonderful about laughter, though, I'm just encouraging you to do it more right now. So if you're thinking about what it might be like to have a good, hearty laugh, well, you've just given yourself a 90% boost on your immunity hormones, according to Dr. Lee Burke. Just thinking about having a great laugh can drop your stress hormones by 70%. That's just thinking about laughing. Research verified. So imagine what actually laughing does. That's another great way to play. And lastly, what we want to share with you right now, one of my personal favorite ways to play, it's on my personal play prescription, is a five-minute dance party. Dancing. So dancing confers all those beautiful benefits of cognitive play but it also builds in physical resilience, flexibility, balance, immunity building. It enhances our overall health. It is one of the most pleasurable social activities if you've not been wounded around your ability to dance. So um, we can work with you on that. That's part of what we do. Um, and Patty Jones is a great example. Is anyone familiar with Patty? OK, so if you've been on YouTube and you've seen her, she's um, 81 years old right now. Patty, at the sprightly young age of 69, took her first salsa lesson. Shortly after the death of her husband, she had not danced for nearly 50 years. She was looking for a way to get back some joy. She was lonely and she was grieving. So she tried dancing, salsa. Well, she not only found her joy, 10 years later she found herself on the stage of Britain's Fat Talent, our version of American Idol, in front of Simon, that super grumpy judge, she made it all the way to the finals. She came in ninth, she and her partner Nika, who's quite a bit younger, but it was Patty, trust me, it was the one that got them to the finals. And today, still dancing, at 81, she is the world's oldest acrobatic salsa dancer. She's in the Guinness World Book of Records. So it is never too late to start dancing. And I do want to remind you that my personal is the five-minute dance party, and I'm encouraged to know that there is scientific evidence that just five minutes of dancing can dramatically increase your energy levels, reduce fatigue, open you up to more creativity, and boost your mood. So it's also, there's no too small amount of dancing, and it's something you can even do in your chair. We did that in our earlier session, some chair dancing. So I encourage you to all dance. A little bit more. And at the Fun Conspiracy, we are big fans of these five to 15 minute daily doses of fun. We like to think of them as power plays. It makes play more accessible. And if you're playing even a little bit every day, you are gaining the benefits the play has to offer, perhaps much more so than if you store it up and try and take two hours here or a one week vacation there. So what are those five to 15 minute power plays. I want to share a few with you before you go so you can take them home and really put them to work for you in your life. One of my favorite, one of our favorites, is taking a play history. And that's simply like we did, asking how you like to play as a child. Who was your best friend? What did you like to do together? What was your favorite game or toy? You would be surprised how sharp recall is when you ask those questions, no matter what memory challenge the person you're speaking with may be facing. I encourage you to have those playful conversations and be sure to share your own. Because when we remember how we like to play, just the memory, remember like the laughter, just anticipating a funny laugh, we start reaping the benefits. Now, striking a power pose, Jenny's already given you a two minute way to like turn it around. Do one with me? Anyone want to do one with me? Yeah, two minutes. <laughs> so play a game, and maybe even more importantly, find out how to make things more gameful. In any activity you're doing, ask yourself, what would make this more fun? And do it. Turn your lemon into a little bit of lemonade. Um, that playful approach is really transformative, and it sets you up for success and you have fun in the process, even if you don't complete what you think you need to do on that to-do list. So 
Five-minute dance party, of course, that's standard prescription. Play with a child or pet. Just a few minutes of spending time with a pet can reduce anxiety. We've studied that over and over. And share a hug or a playful touch. You may have noticed we've snuck several opportunities to reach out and touch someone in our session today. It is one of the first ways we play when we come into this world. And we never outgrow our need for it. So I encourage you, where appropriate, to engage in a playful touch. Asking permission is always a good idea. So let's try a different kind of five-minute power play. We're going to do a group doodle. And for those of you who were in our earlier sessions, this is a different one, so you do not have a leg up on anybody here. Each of you, at each table, there should be um, a sheet of poster board, I'm hoping. So if, if our lovely Maya conference coordinators could help with that, we only need one sheet per um, table. Some of you may want to turn around and work with the table behind you. Okay. So ideally, we'd like eight to ten people with one piece of poster board. Yeah, feel free to move if that's not too much trouble. Musical chairs again, Jen. We've been doing this a lot today. Yeah. And each group will also need some magic markers. There should be one box at the end of each table. Is everybody at a table with a sheet of paper now? Great. OK, in just a moment, I'm going to give you a drawing prompt. We're going to do a group doodle. Doodling can actually help us improve our recall by up to 30%, so it's a great memory booster. And what we're going to do is we're also going to build in the power of playing together. We're going to do this as a group doodle. Each person is going to make one contribution to the same drawing. So they're going to make a mark, make one element of this picture, and then pass it on. It is a doodle, so it should only take you about 10 seconds each. And to add one more little wrinkle, we like to always add a little wrinkle to our play. We're going to ask you to, the first person who starts the drawing, and it doesn't really matter where y'all start, but one person will start and make that first mark once I show the prompt. But after that, pass it to the person on your right, and if you're looping in a circle, just the, it can go across the table. You will then guide the hand of the person you just passed it to. So, for instance, let me be on the right. So I'm going to pass it. I made my mark. I pass it over to Jenny, or the person on my right. And then I'm going to guide her hand to add the next element. And then she'll pass, and she'll guide the hand of the next person. So pass to the right, guide to the right. Does that make sense? The first person will make, go ahead and make an independent mark. By the time it reaches the last person in your group, you should have your completed doodle. Are you ready? Ready for your prompt. Here is your prompt. The funky chicken. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a joyful glow. <laughs> it's you his aura. <laughs> We're from Asheville. We're into auras here. So. <laughs> and you, you can may... start anywhere you like on this drawing. So you, there's no, you can start with a coxcomb. You can start with the glasses, a foot, however you want to start. But and if you have to go around more than once to complete it, that's fine. But when you get done, hold it up. Ready to begin? Go for it. Ready, go. The chicken? Yeah. Yes. So you're going.
going to attempt to doodle the chicken. And bear in mind, with a doodle, there is absolutely no wrong way to doodle. So we're taking all pressure off of that. Beautiful. laughing, that's a good sign. <laughs> You're welcome to, yeah, wrap up, but you can keep passing if you want. already. Stand up and proudly display your work. Yeah. Yay! Woo! This is your refrigerator art, folks. You get to take it home if, if you can uh, figure out who gets to take it home. Actually, in your I'm going to request that y'all leave the funky chickens on the table. We'll take pictures. We will take pictures and make them available on the conference website. So if you would leave your funky chickens on the table, we'll make them accessible via the website. Almost. Almost. Okay, we're going to wrap up and just last part of our presentation. The fun conspiracy, we talk about authentic fun, we talk about authentic joy, because so much is in our culture has been pitched to us in the form of advertising, something that we need to have more of, we need to purchase it, we need to be skinnier, we need to spend more, it's always more, more, more. But when we talk about authentic joy and fun, all the things that contribute to 
our sense of well-being and the physiology of well-being that we've addressed today, these are the things we're talking about. First of all, we are fully engaged and present in the moment when we're having fun. Nothing else matters except for what we are doing at that particular time. Next, we experience all wonder and delight. It doesn't have to be all three at once. It could just be one of them. But that delight, that experience of being really joyfully present to what's going on. Hold on just a second. And then we're open to endless possibilities and we're curious to explore them. That's another facet. Not one of those things cost a dime. Okay? We have dance walks in Asheville. We put on our headphones and we gather with people in costumes and we dance down, to, down the streets to our own music. This is just one of our participants. But it speaks to the fact that when we are in authentic fun and joy, that we feel free. We feel uninhibited, free from judgment. We also experience a creative spirit, okay? and we're not ashamed to express it. 